So yes, yeah, so it's really um, pretty exciting uh, to me to be giving a talk tonight. Um, I indeed have been uh, gardening for a long, long time. And in fact, back in the 90s, I was a master gardener and I dropped out. And the reason I dropped out is because at that time they were, um, I won't say pushing, but the gardening paradigm was mainly exotics and there were a lot of herbicides and pesticides involved. And a lot of insects were considered pests that I later learned were not. Um, and I became interested in native plant gardening and never looked back. And, and that sort of set the whole course of my life actually for quite some time. Uh, until now. I'm, what I'm going to do right now is play a little video that I took a couple summers ago just to sort of get us in the mood and then we'll start. And we should be seeing uh, monarchs very soon. Um, actually, my husband told me he saw one today, which was kind of exciting. Uh, so the first question I'm going to answer is, what is a native plant? Uh, a lot of people think that they see it around, they see it in the woods, it's got to be a native plant. Well, that's not really exactly true. Um, the drawing that you see right now, uh, the echinacea, actually is a native plant, even though many people have them in their yards and don't realize that ec the echinaceas are native plants. So there's a lot of confusion. So this is what a native plant is. Number one, uh, okay, sorry, I apologize. My forward button isn't working. A native plant is a part of the balance of nature that has developed over hundreds or thousands of years in a particular region or ecosystem. And you'll understand what this means in a little while when I, when I explain about that. Number two, the word native should always be used with a geographic qualifier, e.g. Northern Illinois. For example, uh, we could say that a particular, um, well, bur oaks are, are native through a wide swath of the US. However, the bur oaks that grow around here are native to the Chicago region, especially if you go in the forest preserves. Thirdly, only plants found in this country before European settlement are considered to be native to the United States. Now, as soon as the Europeans started coming over here in the 1600s, they were bringing uh, inadvertently, but also on purpose, uh, a lot of plants. Uh, some of the things that they brought with them that were kind of weedy were, for example, plantain, which uh, the native people called white man's footprints. And those actually spread across the country ahead of white settlers. Um, and then, of course, many other plants were just brought in because they were crop plants, uh, wheat, for example, uh, or forage plants, uh, certain kinds of grasses like fescue for their cattle. Um, but prior to that, uh, there was a whole complex of plants that were in place that had been evolving for thousands of years, uh, even during the Ice Age. Now, you have to imagine 10,000 years ago, uh, 20,000 years ago, the Chicago region was covered under about a mile of ice. And south towards a place called Shelbyville, Illinois, there was a literal wall of ice. Uh, and just south of that were a lot of native people because they had been here for maybe 14,000 years. They had spread across the continents, uh, North and South America. And they were, they were making a pretty good living south of the ice sheets. There were also a lot of uh, plants south of the ice sheets because it's a, not a very high elevation uh, in the Chicago region. We're about 650 feet above sea level. And so the, um, there were oaks, there was some tundra along the ice sheet, but then there were oaks, there were grasses, there were flowers. And when 10,000 years ago, roughly, the ice sheets started pulling back, uh, revealing the Chicago Lake Plain, revealing the land that we know today, plants were already sort of like 50 miles south waiting to come in. And so they did. 
first to come were the little floral plant, the, the mosses, the lichens, forbs, and they kind of just sort of spread across and started creating soil where there was crumbled rock and debris left over from the massive weight of the, of the, the, the glaciers. Then came trees and, and gradually they all worked together to create the soil. And also at this time, there was a great, there were great winds. There were wind storms and there was a lot of dust blowing. And, and that all together, the plants plus the dust created something called lus, which is uh, ended up over, over years becoming some of the best soil in the, the world, actually. Illinois, I think, is in the top five for, for good fertile soil underneath, from, partly because of this process and then partly because of um, the actions of the ecosystems that developed, which we'll get to. Another country with you know, top five soil is Ukraine. Um, and they are a great farming country or, or have been. And so we hope that they can, they can get back to that. So what happened was the, U, the Northern Illinois, Illinois area and around the lake and down into Indiana and up into Michigan became this mosaic, this wide landscape, which was a mosaic of grasses, shrubs, ferns, forbs, ground covers, trees. Uh, and there were many, many species of wildlife. There were beaver, there were bison, there were actually wolves, there were coyotes, there were so many birds and turkeys and, and uh, the, the richness of the land was really incredible. And it was managed by the native people. They set fires uh, across the prairie and in the woodlands, partly for better hunting, partly because when they started agriculture, they understood that they would clear the land and, and they would grow their crops and then they would let it go fallow for a while. And, and the prairie or the, 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 the woodland would start coming back. And, and so this, this literally took place for, for thousands of years because the Europeans didn't really get here till 16, 16, 1700. It was in the 1600s that Father Marquette and his folks came, came down the Illinois River. Today, uh, we have a, a continuum of historic ecosystems. We have woodland, we have savanna, and we have prairie. Uh, and they are all very important for carbon sequestration. They have different kinds of soil, but the plants and the under the soil biome, all of the little critters that live in the, in the soil, and the fungi and the, um, and the bacteria and the, the microbes and the plants and the wildlife all work together to create these, these ecosystems that function as, as habitats for which birds and bees and animals can live very comfortably. But we don't have a lot of this left. These shots are actually uh, from the Morton Arboretum and the savanna, which is the, bo the bottom one is, uh, actually in Wisconsin. So woodland has a lot of trees. It's up to 80, 80, to 80 or so uh, percent cover. Savanna is in between uh, a prairie and a woodland. It has wider space trees. Typically the trees are oaks. Uh, and then there's the prairie, which we all know. And remarkably prairies actually in some cases do a better job of sequestering carbon than woodlands do. Woodlands, the carbon is stored in the trees. In prairies, as you know, the, the flowers and the grasses all go dormant in the, in the winter. And what's happening underneath is that the roots are, and the, are storing the, the, the carbon underground. And so they are great carbon sinks. They are, they're, it's just really wonderful. All right, so now in the last hundred years or so, uh, well, actually in the 150 years, but really in the 20th and 21st century, we have what's called ecosystem fragmentation. We've got climate change. We've got species declines. You may have heard about birds declining 30% in the last, since the 70s, uh, insects declining. Uh, and we have soil loss because of the way we farm. 
Uh, there are ways to farm that actually build soil, but our industrial farming system, unfortunately, uh, relies so heavily on chemicals that and, and uh, certain practices that we are losing soil every year. Plus we have, um, you know, we've built up uh, our cities. Uh, we have suburbs where manicuring, you know, if you look at this picture of this suburb, it's, it's grass and maybe two species of non-native plants. And that is a, a, a preferred look as we'll see in a minute uh, for, for many people. So what can we do? We all want to do something, I'm sure. We all, we all are interested in helping other species recover. We are interested in, having, in, in helping nature thrive. We as gardeners have a lot of power because we control land. And there's some ways, there's some now some national movements that uh, are helping gardeners do what they can do to help the earth. Uh, 30 years ago, there wasn't that much compared to what there is now. So I think this, pic this picture is like up on the North Shore, uh, maybe in Wilmette or you know, one of those places up there. And I call this the aspirational landscaping of the past. This is, this is what most people think of when they think of what they would call a nice front yard. This is a nice front yard. It's got some hydrangeas. It's got some non-native uh, decorative grasses. It's got some kind of tree. It's got a few bushes, maybe a couple boxwoods. And it's got a broad swath of grass that I know just by looking at it basically functions as a biological desert. So in this kind of a setting, it's very difficult for bees, for butterflies, for birds, for any, for any other creatures to make much of a living. And we are, as humans, very interested in control. And this is a very controlled landscape. Uh, and I will be talking about that a little more as, as we go. Because this is really still what people you know, you see it in movies, you see it in neighborhoods. It's, it's thought of as, as to be really good, orderly, respectable landscaping. I've got a few other uh, examples to show you, which are a little closer to home. Maybe you recognize some of these houses. Um, these are fantastic houses. I go up the street all the time. Uh, I, Frank Lloyd Wright is one of my favorite, most favorite architects. Uh, at the time that these houses were being built, a guy named Jens Jensen, whom you may have heard of, the designer of Columbus Park, was advocating for native plant gardening. That was back at the turn of the century, the 20th century. And he believed that using native prairie plants would set off prairie architecture better than an expansive one. Uh, and I look at this and I, I start wanting to like do some design work. I'm not a designer, but I, I start wanting to do that. This is another Hope Park house. Um, and this is actually very well landscaped. There, it's symmetrical. Uh, there's some boxwoods, there's some oak leaf hydrangeas. It's really very well done. Um, again, the grass, uh, I could do a whole presentation on grass, which I won't go into, uh, but there's always, what I always wanna say is, even if you have a, if you love order, orderliness and you love symmetry, there's still a place for native plants. And that's one thing people get nervous about. They, they a lot of people say, oh, it's so messy or it's weedy. And that, you know, we have HOA organ, you know, homeowners associations that ban, plants that are taller than two feet. And we have weed ordinances uh, um, and people get in trouble for growing native plants out in their back in their front yards. Uh, and there's things you can do about that so that they don't look so, so crazy. And I'll show you some examples. But I just wanna say there's always a room for native plants. And the other thing I wanna say is a lot of these photos I've taken around Oak Park, because that's where I live and I, um, have taken a lot of these I took in the last week. Uh, and I don't know most of the people whose the photos I took. I'm not meaning to really diss people. 
um, I'm evaluating. And uh, I think that there's a lot of, it's, it's a good example to use real life examples instead of um, giant acre size aspirational native plant gardens that most of us are not ever going to be able to achieve. And so I'm looking at things realistically. So I said that was the aspirational landscaping of the past. Now we have new imperatives because of climate change, um, because of our ecological fragmentation of habitats. So the new imperatives are, in the past, we've asked one thing of our gardens, that they be pretty. Now they have to support life, sequester carbon, feed pollinators, and manage water. Okay, that's really different. Okay, Doug Tallamy is, I'm sure most of you have heard of him. He has written a number of really great books. I highly recommend Bringing Nature Home and Nature's Best Hope. Uh, he has been for many years pushing, pushing, pushing the idea because he's, a, he's a, also a world-class entomologist that we have to plant natives because that is what keeps the ecosystem going. And that in our gardens, we have an opportunity to do that. And if we keep the ecosystem going, then the, in, the, the insects that are adapted to the plants can, can make a living. The birds that require the insects to feed their babies can make a living. Um, not to mention that, that as, as he points out, native plants help you manage water, which is an issue that we have here in Oak Park, definitely. Uh, lots of people have, have, have flooding issues. Secondly, the latest IPCC assessment report about climate change specifically says that maintaining the resilience of biodiversity and ecosystem services at a global scale depends on effective and equitable conservation of approximately 30 to 50% of Earth's land, freshwater and ocean areas, including currently near natural ecosystems. But where are we going to get the land? Humans control something, oh, I don't even know what, it's like 50, over, over 50, 70%. We control ecosystem functioning. Um, and the land that we're going to set aside has to come from somewhere. And that's where gardeners can come in. We all have, um, even on a balcony, you can do something to help. Uh, improve the ecosystem. So what the new paradigm is, is regenerative landscape, creating an ecological network. Because what an ecological, an, eco, an ecosystem is really a, a collection of interwoven ecological relationships. It's the relationships between the birds and the insects and the plants. Birds need the shrubs to, to uh, nest in. They need the trees. The, the pollinators need the plants. The plants need the pollinators. Uh, the plants need the roots. The root systems need all of the little critters that live under the, under the ground. Uh, it all meshes together. And those relationships are incredibly important because that's what an ecosystem is. It's, it's really a system of relationships. So to get back to gardening, two important things to remember about native plant gardening. And this is really hard for beginning nat native plant gardeners to, to really get, is that wild native plants will procreate, they will move around, they will multiply, and they will decide for themselves where they want to grow. Uh, they will, it, it's really kind of incredible, but it's also, if you're used to landscaping with, uh, exotic ornamental plants, which are bred to be well-behaved and to stick up, stay in one place and not do too much, uh, you're going to be really surprised. And if you're a person who really likes order, you're really going to be surprised because, because native plants don't behave that way. And they have behaviors. And I, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to get all woo-woo and say, you know, they have thought processes, but they definitely uh, have an impact in, in the world in helping create the kind of place where they want to live. So it's, it's something that as you get experienced at native plant gardening, 
you can work with your native plants. You can say, well, I'm gonna put a few here and I'm gonna put a few here. And, and the ones, if they like it really well, they'll start mul multiplying. And you kind of um, take account of that. Uh, and then you edit um, uh, some areas where maybe they are starting to come in, you know, some taller ones are getting in front of the shorter ones and you don't like that. So you just edit it and maybe you, you pull them or you give them away or, or you move them to another part of your garden. Secondly, and this is crucial, native plant gardening takes less effort, fewer inputs and machinery, but more knowledge and skill. And what I mean by that is you, there's less, you know, you don't have to, not that anybody double digs anymore, but you don't, they, they did when I started. Um, you don't have to, your cleanup is different. You don't have to use your belief blower so much. You don't have to uh, use, you never have to use fertilizer. You don't have to use fungicides. You, I mean, it's just, it's really kind of incredible, but you do have to pay attention. You, you need to learn a little more. You can't just plop a boxwood in the shrub in the ground and just okay, there it is. Uh, you sort of have to get to know these plants and it needs a little more skill. So it can become a much, much more rewarding uh, hobby or way of gardening, I feel. Uh, other people would disagree. If you are a rose breeder or you are really into collecting 25 or 30 or 40 um, varieties of daylilies, you, you might disagree with some of that. But I've given talks to the Chicago Daylily Day uh, Society about adding diversity into their, their daylily areas. And, and, and they, were pretty, they were pretty receptive. So the first thing you wanna do is you wanna assess your yard's landscape and uh, decide where you want to add um, uh, your, your, your plants. And these are, I'm focusing a lot on front yards, but I'll be talking about backyards too. And a lot of people, and this is again in Oak Park, uh, a lot of people got the idea that they should take out the grass. So they take out their grass in the front yard and then they put in a lot of mulch and then they add a few, this person added some hostas, they've got a couple ewes, I think they've got some hydrangeas in the background. Yeah, here's hydrangea. Um, and then I'm not sure what this ground cover is. I, I, I'm not really sure what it is. And I very uncharitably, um, and a lot of people like me call this a mulch garden because really you're the, the, the highlight of the garden is mulch. And that's the same thing over here. Um, and these are perfect spots. They're not that big and you could do something really nice with them in your front yard. And here we are back to that house we were looking at before. And here again, you've got, uh, you've got some hosta, right? You've got some, I'm not sure what this is. Uh, it's really a nice layout, but you could always add some native ground covers like right in here. You could add some sedges. Sedges are very wonderful plants. They never grow too tall. You don't have to mow them, but they look kind of grassy. Uh, and you could add some spring ephemerals. You could have the most beautiful little spring, um, spring garden in here. And then you could sprinkle in some summer blooming and fall blooming things if you wanted. And it wouldn't be that tall. It wouldn't be taller than your hostas. It wouldn't be taller than this. And it would be very attractive because here again, you have the, you know, some nice plants, lots of mulch. And there is a term that regenerative farmers use called armor the soil. And what that means is you want, you want your soil uh, to be covered with plants because wherever nature sees bare soil, she's gonna come in, she's gonna, plants are gonna come in. And so why not choose the plants that you wanna be, that you wanna have there. Now, this is another front yard. Now this is actually up the block from the first two front yards that I showed you. Um, th this is the home of Deb Stewart and Roy Plotnick, uh, who uh, Judy knows. And they actually had a landscape designer uh, come in and sort of help them with what they wanted to do, what they should do. And what they've got is a beautiful 
This is a sedge meadow, a little sedge meadow, and they've got some ginger back here. They've got their shrubs. This is a red bud tree. Uh, and it's, I find it to be very decorative. And these, there's some beautiful blue Virginia bluebells. Blue now what's gonna happen is the bluebells are gonna go dormant. The sedges are gonna grow and have little cute little seeds. Other things are going to come up uh, because this is still spring and you've got something here and you've got some coral bells here for sort of a, an accent. And then you've got some native grasses here. The secret of this front yard which is really, I personally think is much more decorative and, and good looking and ecologically functional than those other two that I showed you are, is that in the back, there's this, I was looking at and I said, so, you know, what, what's this Roy? You know, what is this plug doing in the middle of your garden? And it's kind of back in this area. And he told me that what they had done was the, the gutters, the, the pipes, the drain pipes from the gutters go underground into a, an area underneath the yard. And this is, and when it rains, this whole area functions as a rain garden. And when it gets, and, and this is like a little um, overflow pipe so that if it gets too full, it just kind of overflows into the garden. And, and um, I just thought that was, it's so ingenious. And so this is completely, uh, ecologically correct for our place. For our place, it's decorative. It looks good. Uh, they don't have to mow. They don't have to hire someone else to mow. They don't have to use a leaf blower. Uh, and it, it, there is some weeding involved, uh, and they have to replenish some of the mulch once in a while. But it's it's really a a really nice solution for uh, a small front yard where what would you do? You'd have a grass and some grass and some annuals and, and maybe, I don't know. Oh, I forgot the sedges. Okay. Now back to that other very grand part of Oak Park. Uh, I was, I just, uh, some friend of mine showed me that near those other houses, someone is doing a, a decarbonization project with this very nice Frank Lloyd Wright house. They have put in geothermal heat and they also took out the lawn and this is another, they're still working on it, but this is another sedge meadow and native decorative grasses. And I'm looking forward to seeing what else they do with it. But again, uh, by doing that, they've just cut their carbon expenditures. Uh, there's no emissions from lawn mowers. There's no emissions for leaf blowers. Uh, there's no, Fertilizer and fertilizer, of course, is made from natural gas and is a very uh, energy intensive process to do that. Uh, so it's actually architecture, it's actually part of, uh, I'm not sure if they, they're doing the, the, the Green Sites Initiative or if they're doing LEED, but they, it is at, how you landscape can actually um, be part of the point system if you enroll in one of those programs. So I was very pleased to see that. So I'm gonna go back backwards a little bit. And what we were looking at were some pretty good examples of creating structure with native trees and shrubs. In nature, like that natural landscape I showed you in the beginning, uh, there, there are layers. Uh, you have the canopy layer, which are the trees, you've got the sub canopy layer, uh, which can be the low tree layer, and the shrub layer, you've got vines going up your, you know, that go up. Um, I love this. This is actually from a permaculture book called Gaia's Garden, but it's really suitable for any kind of a, a garden that you're thinking about ma making because you have the root layer and then you have, not only do you have the herbs, which mean in this case, in the gardening, um, in restoration case, herbs are, soft are non-woody plants. So herbs actually include flowers, grasses, sedges, anything that's non-woody, not a bush, not a shrub. Uh, and then the ground cover layer are the little creeping plants that, that go on, um, like grass would be, might be a, a, a ground cover layer. So what does that look like? Well, you've seen a couple examples. 
Uh, here's another example, um, Claudia West and Thomas Rayner plant, uh, planting in a post wild world is a really great book about ecological gardening uh, and design. And she, they codified it. Like you have the ground cover layer, the seasonal theme plants. If you think back to that little front yard, I just showed you the seasonal theme plants would be the Virginia, uh, Virginia bluebells because they're, they're in beautiful, glorious bloom right now. And then they'll, they'll go dormant and then something else will start up. And then you've got the, the tall, the structural layer and a structure can be shrubs and trees. It can also be tall plants like Joe Pieweed, if you've ever seen it. It's a beautiful, big, tall, purple, purple flowers, attracts butterflies like mad. Monarchs love it, bees love it, and it's seven feet tall. So that can function as a structural layer in the, in the correct place. The, uh, and this is another fairly small front yard in Oak Park. And now it's a little radical. I will, I will admit, people who like a lot of orderliness um, might be a little uncomfortable with this. Uh, but for other people who have maybe a more uh, romantic idea about gardening, they might like it very well. Uh, the thing that it has to sort of, it is orderly. Um, it's lush, but it's very orderly. It's got an edge, so you know where the garden starts. It's got some ground cover down here. It's got taller plants, but you see how they're contained by the edge. So it's, it might be a little bit more um, comfortable for a lot of folks. And then you've got the tree coming up out of it. And this is, this is really how trees like to grow. Trees do not like to grow out of grass, turf grass. They do not like to grow out of mulch circles. Mulch, a lot of people think mulch circles are a little bit better than, than uh, turf grass, and they might be. But trees really, really respond well to companion plants. If, if it's a native tree, a, a suite of companion plants that are suitable to it, um, it's all the plants are happy, trees are happy. And then, and then the insects and the bugs and the, the, the birds and everybody else is happy. So that's the way to go as, as far as I can think. And layers can work at any scale. This, this is actually a, a sort of a food forest. Uh, and this is something that's getting very popular in Oak Park. We're gonna have a, uh, West Cook Wildlands is having its garden walk on um, July 23rd. Uh, and there's a couple gardens where people have chickens and they have food plants scattered in. And uh, it's, it's really a nice uh, complementary way to garden. If you have some trees, you've got some shrubs, uh, you've, got your, you've got some herbs, you're growing some tomatoes, but you're also growing your native plants. Because if you've got native flowering plants, uh, they will attract bumblebees. And bumblebees actually um, pollinate tomatoes better than honeybees. Bumblebees sonicate, they buzz, and then that causes the pollen to fall. And honeybees cannot do that. Uh, bumblebees are native, honeybees are not. Uh, and it's it, native bees actually pollinate a lot of food um, much more efficiently and much quicker uh, than honeybees do, as much as we rely on honeybees. So you can go from one extreme, and this again is very manicured, and they've got their impatience growing in the little mulch, uh, mulch circles, and they've got their their Chinese probably uh, looks like um, Miscanthus sinensis or something like that. Their their uh, Eurasian grasses, and that looks like some Stelladoro day lilies, I think, back there. But then you can go crazy. And this is, this is a lot of people plant their, their uh, parkways. Uh, and this is a, a young red oak and you've got wild geraniums and you've got sedges, uh, Carex radiata, I think, or uh, rosea. And then you've got some other things. And again, this might be too much for some people. Maybe you don't wanna plant your parkway like this, uh, but in, in terms of ecology, it's, it sure beats what we see on a lot of parkways. And then in general, when you're, when you're gardening, 
uh, and again, native plants help us with this, you have to consider the needs of your species. If you're trying to help the bumblebees, if you're trying to help the monarchs, if you're trying to help the, the, the cardinals and the robins and the, um, uh, all the other birds that live here in Oak Park, there's, I think, 96 species or more. You know, there's woodpeckers, there's all kinds of things, and they need a place to live. Um, forget the pesticides or fungicides. If you have enough biodiversity in your yard, you will not need them because everything starts to balance out. You do chop and drop cleanup. I'm not going to go into that too much because I'm talking about plants, but that's basically where you, um, instead of using the, instead of cutting everything down in the fall, you wait till spring, you cut your stems a little higher so that bees can, uh, solitary bees can make their nests inside the stems. And then you drop the other, the other stems on the ground to help decompose back into the soil. You leave your leaves underneath, the, um, underneath your shrubs. And the reason you leave your leaves is because Maybe you've noticed that fireflies have declined. Well, one reason they've declined is because firefly young, the, the fireflies you see are only, they're out for, they're the adults, they're out for a couple of weeks in the summer. Firefly young, larvae and some of the other instars can live for up to two years underneath the leaf layer. And so if you're, if you're blow, you know, or your landscapers are coming in and leaf blowing out all the leaves, then you're killing butterflies, you're killing uh, fireflies, you're, you are making it much more inhospitable uh, for these very beneficial insects. Firefly young kind of go around on the ground and they, they are hunters at that stage and they, they eat sort of more pesky um, beetles and things. Uh, this is a picture, I love this picture, it's a backyard. Uh, you can see the house over here. These are the fireflies. And this is the last thing that I wanna say um, is turn off your lights at night. A lot of folks in Oak Park and, all, and other suburbs, uh, especially since the pandemic have put up rows and rows and strings of party lights across their yards. And it's really cheerful when you're out there, when you're socializing outside. But when you go in at night, just turn them off. And, and the reason is, that it's better for our circadian river, uh, rhythm. And it's also the fireflies rely on their flashes to be able to mate. And if there's too much light in the backyard, they can't see what, what they're looking for. It, it, it just fades it out. Uh, and so I'm very, I'm kind of intense about this because my yard, is full of native plants. And I, I can look on from, from, my, from my deck and I can see that I have more fireflies in my yard than, I have, than the neighbors have in their yard. And one reason, not only do I have native plants, but I, I don't have any lights in my backyard. I have a porch light that I turn on when I need it. Uh, there's the alley light. Um, and the other, the other thing people say is, well, oh, but it's, it's, it's safer. Well, if you have motion sensor lights, that's safer, but you don't need to leave them on all night. Uh, and so end of lecture, but I hope that some of you will, will think about that and, and, and take that home with you. All right, so the other, the other I'm gonna go back to the soil for a bit. Um, you feed the underground e ecosystem and the way you do that is with a, some wood chips and leaf litter you just, as I said, you leave the leaves because the native plants know how to get up through the leaves and the leaves are decomposing and improving the soil. And the little critters, the decomposers and the, the critters that live in the soil are making use of that organic material and helping pull um, carbon down into the soil and storing it um, through the magic of, of uh, leaf, of, of, of roots, during photosynthesis, well, I'll explain. I wasn't going to explain it, but I will. Um, in photos, during photosynthesis, the plant uh, uses air and water to make sugars, uh, and some of these are carbon sugars. And what they do is they the carbon sugars come down into the roots, and they the plants actually 
um, share some of their carbon sugars with the mycorrhizae funga, fungus that networks. And what the networks of fungus do is that they, or fungi, is they bring nutrients that the plants can't get. And so they trade, um, they trade nutrients for the carbon sugars. Uh, and that's another example of ecological relationships where everybody benefits. And then what happens is the, the, the fungi actually and other um, elements in the soil produce what are called exudates and they uh, clump together and that, that's carbon that's in the soil and it can stay there for many, many years. And of course, that's why uh, the uh, IPCC and other people recommend what they call natural solutions is because the earth actually absorbs carbon. And we have, since we have this problem with carbon emissions, the more trees, the more prairies, the more gardens we have, the more carbon actually gets stored in the soil. Uh, and that's, that's very important right now. And it always is important, but it's particularly important um, in terms of what we have to deal with. Uh, so this picture is actually from my yard. Uh, and I just, I, I just took it, hmm, did I take it this morning? Maybe yesterday. Uh, and you can see that I've got the wild geraniums. You can see in here are leaves. They fell off the service berry uh, bush or shrub that, that it, uh, it, it grows in this area. And I've got native ginger, I've got iris reticulata, I've got some, some, some sedges. Um, and then it, later in the summer, again, uh, I've got some um, ageratum altissima that'll come up in here and it has white flowers. Uh, I've got some, you can't see it, but some big leaf aster that'll bloom in the fall. I've got some Jacob's ladder over here. Uh, and so that's another thing to think about is you don't wanna put only one thing uh, in, your, in your native garden. You want biodiversity, you want diverse plants. And they start, like I said, they start moving around. I didn't have quite this much ginger. Um, there, the Jacob's ladder over here uh, wasn't, I did not plant this Jacob's ladder. The, the uh, wild geranium are multiplying. And so the garden looked kind of sparse a couple of years ago, but now it's really filled in and it looks good, in my opinion speaking as the gardener. Here's another. Uh, some people call these kinds of plantings uh, living mulch. Uh, this, is, this is an under a pagoda dogwood tree, which is a small native tree. It's very beautiful. Uh, and these are celandine poppies, there's violets, there's Virginia bluebells again, and Virginia water leaf, which works really well, uh, is somewhat People think it's, it's somewhat aggressive, but in a, in a ground cover, you want something that's somewhat aggressive. Uh, same thing for, for native ginger. But I would never just put only Virginia water leaf or only ginger underneath a tree. I would definitely always have a group of species, a community, and it functions as a community. And they are companions with each other, and they are companions to the the tree. And they are the kinds of plants that if this tree were in the wild and, and you were in an ideal woodland setting, then these are the kinds of plants that would be growing with this tree there. And again, and again, I just want to reemphasize that there's no, you don't need to rake, you don't need leaf blowers, it's quieter, it's more pleasant, you have fewer emissions. Uh, and it's really, really fun to just watch things grow. So uh, we've got native trees are best. Never plant a Bradford pear. These are, these are actually considered to be invasive species. Don't plant a Chinese hybrid catalpa. Those are starting to go into the forest preserves. Norway maples are problematic. Uh, if you have one in your backyard, you probably under you probably have struggled to plant things under it forever. Weeping willows are can also be invasive. What you want to plant are American trees: American basswood, American oaks, hackberry, ironwood, 
Kentucky coffee tree, native maples. There's so many beautiful trees. Same thing, small native trees. The ones on the left are perfectly nice. Chinese fringe tree is becoming invasive. But again, you've got an American fringe tree. You've got pagoda dogwoods, service berries, red buds, wafer ash, and some, and, um, it's really been great over the last 10 years to see how many service berries and red, red buds in particular people are, are planting because they're just gorgeous when they're in bloom. Again, all these shrubs just don't do it. Um, Asian honeysuckle and buckthorn are actually illegal in Illinois. You can't buy them, but they're around. Uh, barberry is terrible. Um, Things like lilacs, if you've got a lilac, I've got two lilacs in my backyard. I'm not going to cut them down. I'm not saying cut those down. I, I would suggest cutting out, getting out rid of your bar, your barberry and honeysuckle if you've got it. Um, but, or if you've got yew bushes, just keep them trimmed. They're not invasive. Um, but instead, you've got such a beautiful, wide variety of, of native shrubs. And there, there's some of them are starting to become uh, available at regular nurseries. And there's other nurseries there's, that deal in native plants. And I don't have to keep going. I can say the ground covers um, shape uh, pretty much, you know, get beyond your hostas. Uh, take out your lily of the valley. That's a terrible invasive plant. Um, use the natural ground covers. Use the shade loving spring ephemerals and then in the spring and the, when they're done blooming it's just a beautiful tapestry of greens and, and different shaped leaves and the sun lovers you probably already have because american um prairie plants are popular around the world they plant them in england uh because they're such fabulous sun loving plants So there's two things I want to tell you about. The Homegrown National Park was set up by Doug Tallamy and his colleagues. And the idea is if everybody planted, made a little national, made a little native park in their own backyard, <clears throat> there are millions, literally millions of acres that could be returned to nature in that way. So this is a couple, I think they live in Virginia. Um, and this is their backyard. They decided to get rid of some of the grass and plant a little, make it a little sanctuary. And then when it grew in, it, to me, I think that's really beautiful. You've got enough grass to walk around on. Um, and then you've got this, this really fun uh, landscape in your backyard. And you can do more with your backyard. You know, you can put in those tall, tall things if you want to, because you, you're not trying to uh, conform to um, the block that you live on. You can be more adventurous. The other thing is, is 30 by 30 America the Beautiful. Maybe some of you have heard of this. Um, in Illinois, a task force has been formed to figure out how to set aside 30% of the land in Illinois uh, to be habitat and to be ecologically um, sound uh, 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 ecosystems for the use of other species as well as humans. Now, what does that mean? And, and oh, I should say they're going to give a report to the governor, uh, I think in June or July, with their recommendations for how to do that. And they're including agricultural land, urban land, suburban land, um, every kind of land. It's not, it's not just forest preserves. So in Cook County, we've got 604,800 acres of land. A third of that, as you see, is 201,900 acres. Now, the forest preserves of Cook County uh, have already protected about 11% of the land. So somewhere we need to find 132,900 acres just in Cook County. How are we going to do it? Well, our backyards can make a big difference and our front yards. All that land that we control as gardeners can really help. So you could take a backyard like this, another mulch garden. Um, Lots of bit, some big ferns, very orderly, and you can make it a beautiful backyard like this. And I'm sure a lot of you recognize some of the, the butterfly weed, the monarda, the um, there's some Joe Pie weed growing up there. Um, and again, this is 
this is beautiful. It's habitat, it's pretty, it manages water. It does all those things that Doug, the Doug Tallamy quote was talking. And it's easy. You can, the other thing about 30 by 30 is you can set aside 30% of a balcony. You can do 30% of a tiny backyard. You can do 30% of a large estate. It's, it's like, it's a fractal kind of thing. Uh, it works at every single scale. Um, and another thing that is really nice to remember is that 223 square feet makes a very viable pollinator garden. Uh, and you can break that up into a couple of garden beds, but a lot of folks have enough room to make a nice pollinator garden. And, and with 223 square feet, you have room for native bees to live because a lot of native bees never go more than 10 yards away from the, where, they grow, where they're born. Uh, and you also have room to put in, as they do in this picture, uh, groups of native plants. And that makes it, that's much easier for uh, pollinators to find. Uh, and you can have three season bloom. And that's, that's very important because there's early season pollinators and late season pollinators. And this, I'm just showing you, this was a delightful backyard I visited last week in Oak Park. Uh, and, she, and it's early spring, you know, it's spring, so things are blooming, but the leaves aren't fully out. But, but when I was there, the birds were amazing because they were up in these tall trees. And in the summer, it just is going to turn into a beautiful, shady, lush area with this is sort of back in this like private little corner where you can just sit with your friends or sit in the afternoon and read or whatever. Um, so I'm, I was very, I felt really great about um, seeing this backyard because I wanted to, to show it to everybody. Uh, I've got online resources. You can, uh, you can take, I put, I set this up so you could do a screenshot. Um, and and uh, some of these I, I used and some of these you might want to just visit. Uh, Illinois Wildflowers has like great information on every single wildflower you would want. Chicago Botanical Garden has a list of invasive species to avoid. Um, you can find out more about Homegrown National Park. Uh, so if you take a screenshot, then you can visit later. These are some of my favorite books. Uh, I did this so you could take a screenshot. Um, these are all really, really good books. Now, I haven't read this one. I've read articles um, about the guy in reviews, it, but it talks about like how to plant a hellscape, a hell, what is it, a hell strip, you know, that place between the, the driveway and it gets really hot. Um, and then there's some wonderful books saying what alternatives, if you're thinking of planting uh, this kind of non-native tree, here's three native trees that you could plant instead. And uh, so this, this is another screenshot where you can buy native plants. Uh, we have a more complete listing at West Cook Wild Ones resources. Uh, we, West Cook Wild Ones, we just our, our spring plant sale is actually still going on. If you go to our website, we're go, it's going till May 15th. So you, you actually could, could buy some plants. We've got some pretty, pretty great plants, I'm here to tell you. Uh, Possibility Place is great for trees and shrubs. And we have a fall shrub sale also. Um, and uh, whoops, sorry about that. Now I have to get back. Um, and then if you are looking for native plant landscape designers, these are all vetted by West Cook Wild Ones and they all do a really, really good job. So again, another, another screenshot. And that's it. So the swallowtail is gonna say goodbye. And then I'll be done. So thank you very much for listening. That was great. Thank you so much. That was that was really comprehensive and really um, just a really well done talk. So thank you so much. We actually don't have too many questions. Um, I think we just kind of have one main question, and then maybe um, kind of a smaller groups. So maybe if we want to, we can even open up um, 
to a discussion. I think the first question um, is from Chris. So Chris has a really small, mostly shady, low-lying yard. Mm -hmm. And they'd love to replace the patchy lawn that they have with some native ground cover, mm -hmm. um, perhaps even like a rain garden with plants. Um, how do they even begin to start something like that? Um, well, one thing they could start is by, we're, uh, West Cook Wildlands is having a talk this Sunday about Savannah rain gardens. Uh, and uh, it's, Julia Bunn is a landscaper who will be addressing some of that, that question. And uh, I, I would wanna look at it, but I would suggest maybe if it's a very small yard, having a little bit of a patio and putting in uh, a lot of, again, sedges, which help and, and uh, ginger and find, find plants that like sort of shady, damper areas. And there are some very nice plants that, that like that. Um, uh, it would take a little bit of research, but uh, that would be a, it would be a good project. So yeah, so if there's any other questions or anyone wants to you know, provide some thoughts or maybe some successes that they had in their yard, um, please feel free to unmute yourself. And um... I'd love to pick your brain a little bit, Adrian. I put in um, Canadian anemone. Uh-huh, oh, Canada anemone, yes. Canada anemone. Yes, yes, um, yes. I, didn't realize, I think I heard uh, another, um, it was like a wild ones national talk. And, and when they named that plant, I was like, oh, I just put four of those in. I now have like 40. Yes. I mean, it, yeah. it, it is um, hard. How do I manage? How do I manage? <laughs> When Sorry, I, I shouldn't laugh. You're laughing um, at me. Yeah, I no, mean, I'm, I'm the experimental it. gardener, but like I, <laughs> yeah, we, you know, we've I, all, we've have, all I have a look that I, I want, and uh -huh. um, right. you know, right. so. Um, the thing that I can say is there are some plants where they will say in the description, not advised for small yards. Okay. And Canada anemone is one of those okay. because remember, native plants are used to growing in large landscapes. And they're also used to growing with competition. So if you see Canada anemone in the woods, you won't see that much of it because there's ginger, there's violets, there's just all these other plants competing with it. Mm -hmm. uh, at the Botanic Garden by the Plant Science Center, they've got this giant rain garden swale. Mm -hmm. And they use Canada uh, uh, anemone in that situation. Okay. where it can just roam the way it wants. Another mm -hmm. one that um, can makes beautiful patches in the woods, but you don't really want it in a small yard is um, Mayapple. Those big I have that apple. right next to it. Yeah. I knew right. you were gonna say that. So I maybe they're right gonna- <laughs> Maybe they're going to compete with each other. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to take a picture and I'll send it to you guys if you're interested. <laughs> but I literally have this army of Mayapple that started uh -huh. at like five plants. And now, again, there's like 50. Yeah. And um, next to it is, um, I've got pen sedge in there. And then mm -hmm. I've got um, this Canada anemone that I, I put in. And it's just like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and so, that just depends. So what do I do? Like, how do I how do I can try to control it? Do I have to eradicate it? I don't. Um, want that's a difficult question. You could. Okay. Uh, Mayapple is rhizomatous. Actually, so is uh -huh. Canada. You could try okay. sinking uh, a barrier around it. Okay. You could try that. I've never done okay. that. But that it seems like it might it might work. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It, it it depends on. I have um, I have Monarda. Didyma, the red monarda, kind of mm -hmm. running rampant through my yard, and I, I just sort of put up with it. And then where where I don't want it, I pull it out. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm going to plant something else, I'll just pull it out and put mm -hmm. put something else in. Okay, yeah, I'm learning, you know, as I go. But um, the, that little corner back there is is starting to get a little overcrowded with these plants. But um, yeah, well, who yeah. wants to ask Adrian some questions? Do we have anything in the chat? I mean, it's it's so informative, and it was a great to just get that whole historical um, perspective. Maybe um, I threw too much out there. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, unmute you guys if you want to um, ask. 
you know, Adrian, she's so knowledgeable and uh, you could, um, you know, find out whatever you want to find out. I'll, I'll um, thank you um, for taking the time to put this presentation together and making it so relevant to Oak Park and our um, gardens. And um, it was just a fantastic presentation. I'm going to stop our recording.